This is the second in a series of four lectures on the epistle of First John. And I should have said this at the beginning, but what I think we'll do here, now that I've had a chance to really look it over, is to uh, take two sessions, actually take three lessons on First John, and then the final lesson of the series on uh, Second and Third John. So uh, this means that we have uh, two more lessons here on these chapters on First John. And thus far we have looked at the source. We said that the epistle of First John is a book about fellowship. And we've looked at the source of our fellowship, and then the purpose of fellowship, the requirements of fellowship, and then the tests of this fellowship. Here John the Apostle lists 12 tests that the believer is to take, uh, whereby he may know that, number one, he's saved, and secondly, that he's walking with God in fellowship. And so this is a good test for, for us all to take. And I, had, uh, I took this test myself when I uh, was going through the organizational material here, or trying to organize the material, and, and I flunked some of these questions. Uh, but I think I passed enough to determine that I uh, am indeed in fellowship. But uh, let's go through these one at a time. Uh, one question here, do I conduct my life down here in view of the rapture? And by the way, this does not mean if you flunk some of these uh, tests or some of these questions that you're unsaved, but it probably means that you're out of fellowship with God and that you're not walking in the light as, as he is in the light. But what does the... What does the doctrine of the rapture mean to me? Do you know there is a special reward, not only uh, fellowship down here, but there's a special reward given in heaven concerning uh, the, uh, the love that a person has for the rapture. And the Apostle Paul, some of his last words before he was martyred in Rome, uh, speak about this uh, fellowship or speak about this reward uh, for the rapture. And in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, Paul says, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. For I fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So the crown of righteousness can be earned by all those who love his appearing. So this first question is, do I conduct my life down here in view of the rapture? Uh, John says in verse 3 of chapter 3, And every man that hath this hope in him, what hope? Well, the hope of the rapture, purifieth himself even as he is pure. One of the reasons that I wanted to quit smoking of course, the basic reason, I knew I couldn't get into the Moody Bible Institute if I did, but one of the reasons, even before that, several years before I finally gave it up, uh, was the, uh, the terrible knowledge that I had that the rapture, I felt, could take place at any minute, and I had actually sometimes would uh, start a, uh, smoking a cigarette and, and uh, uh, throw it away before I even finished it, because that's the last thing that I wanted, was to... Uh, be caught at the rapture with a cigarette in my hand. Uh, well, uh, we need to ask ourselves how much the, uh, the doctrine of the rapture means to us. I read a statement some time ago uh, in a spurious, uh, or in a, in a book, a spurious book, supposedly a book that should have been added to the canon of the Bible, and we know that we have all the books of the Bible, but in this uh, spurious book, Jesus supposedly made a statement uh, concerning our subject here today. And uh, although I'm sure he didn't make that statement, yet it is a good statement. And here's the statement, supposedly, that Jesus made. He said, Use your life as a bridge to cross upon and not to build upon. Now, I think that's good. Let me repeat it. Use your life down here as a bridge to cross upon and not to build upon. Uh, we... Uh, my wife and I uh, uh, lived uh, some time, uh, at least we sort of grew up in, uh, in and around Quincy, Illinois. And uh, right uh, uh, west of the city of Quincy is the, uh, the old Mississippi. And uh, that separates uh, 
Missouri from Illinois, and often I've crossed that Mississippi River uh, two or three times a day when I finished my college in Missouri, and I had a church in Illinois, and I went back and forth. And, and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of things on that bridge. I've seen men attempt to fish and little boys throwing rocks and, and uh, people uh, running across the bridge and cars and trucks and everything, of course, crossing it. But I've never seen anybody try to build uh, a house or a business on that bridge. Now, even though it would be... Uh, you know, permitted by the law, it'd be rather foolish to build a house on a bridge. Now, our life is a bridge. It, it, um, it uh, stems uh, eternity past and eternity to come, and we're to use it to cross upon in order to um, prepare for heaven, you see. And uh, so we need to look at life as a believer in terms of this bridge, and we look for the rapture, the end of the bridge, when Jesus comes to receive us and do himself. So I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that's extremely important, and, and uh, you can test the, uh, your spiritual fellowship or the gauge of your fellowship, spirituality, uh, by how much the doctrine of the rapture means to you. And then the second question, do I continually dwell in sin? John says in chapter 3, verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, as you have in your notes, uh, almost all these verbs are in the present tense, and it means um, they continually sinneth. Uh, so it said, Whosoever abideth in, in him uh, does not continue to sin. Whatsoever sinneth, whosoever sinneth habitually hath not seen him, neither know him. Now, I believe in the eternal security of the believer, as you well know. And I think a man can get out of the will of God and maybe for a while live like the devil. But I do know this, that one of two things will happen in the life of that man if he's saved and he's in sin. Number one, God will step in and chasten him, or God will step in and kill him, one of the two. And we'll talk about that sin unto death a little later. But uh, this is a real... I think mark of spirituality here, do I continually dwell in sin? If I do, of course, I have no fellowship. And if I have really no guilt feeling, I may not even be saved. But that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. All right, and then the third question is, do I hate my spiritual brother? John says, if a man says, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? Let's look at these other two. Not only do I hate my spiritual brother, but do I desire to help my brother, and do I really love my brother? Now, uh, let us suppose that uh, I would get a call from Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, tonight uh, from a stranger. And he would say, uh, I uh, understand I'm talking to Harold Wilmington. Yes, you are. May I help you? Well, my name is Joe Blow. And I'll tell you the truth, I have a family, and uh, I don't have any money, and I'm wondering if you could send some groceries up here or uh, send me some money that I might buy some groceries. Now, chances are I might do that. I'm not saying I would. I might do that. But let us suppose that I would get another call that night and from Grand Rapids and this time I would recognize the voice and the voice would say hello Harold and I'd say yes he said this is Gordon your brother and sure enough I do have a brother named Gordon in Grand Rapids Michigan now uh, Gordon certainly would not have to say this but if he did if he would say you know Harold I'm really down on my luck and I need some money for some groceries will you send me that money well, I'll tell you, there wouldn't even be a second thought whether I would help Gordon. I like to think that I would help that stranger. There's no doubt about it in my mind, though. I would help Gordon. I would say, Gordon, whatever I have is yours. You tell me how much you need. Why would I do that for him, for Gordon, and I wouldn't be as prone to do it for Joe Blow? Because Gordon is my brother. And so one of the marks, I think, of spirituality fellowship 
one of the tests is, do I really love my brother? And if I am a believer and another believer asks me to do something, he is my brother and my my growth and maturity in Christ, I think, is dependent upon how I react to this. So, very important test about my concern about my brother. If I have no concern about Christians, perhaps they're not my brothers and sisters because maybe I have never been born again. Now, again, let me not, uh, I don't want to scare some of you in thinking that you're not saved, but but if you have no, if uh, your best friends are not among those who profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you feel uncomfortable around them, uh, then very frankly, I would reevaluate my conversion experience. I'll tell you, I would do that. Now, uh, another test of this fellowship is do I really love God? Before I got saved, I, um, I was a little embarrassed when. As a boy, I would go to Sunday school and church and hear grown men stand up and tell how they love Jesus. Now, it seemed rather strange for me for a man to speak of his love for another man. Now, that I didn't have any problems with uh, the, the gay liberation movement in those days, of course, so I didn't equate it with that. But still, it was, uh, you know, uh, a kid would love his dad and mom and a girlfriend, maybe, and perhaps grandma and grandpa. But... But uh, for, a, for a man to love another man, I just didn't, and especially a man you couldn't see, and you'd never seen, uh, God's Son. I, I had a fear of God's Son, and, and I sort of dreaded dying because I knew I wasn't ready to meet him, and uh, I, was, uh, I was awed uh, at his uh, presence. I never doubted his existence, but I certainly didn't love him until I got saved. And then uh, I remember one of the first congregational songs that I was uh, allowed to participate in uh, right after I got saved. And it was, of course, that hymn that speaks of the love of Christ. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And what a joy and thrill it was to sing that song because I found to my amazement that there was a real love for Jesus in my heart. Do I really love God? John says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. And then, and we've touched on this briefly already, do I enjoy a rapport with other servants of God? John says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I think it would be said that a Christian with no friends that are Christians may not himself be a Christian. Uh, we enjoy singing that song also around Thomas Road, especially at communion service. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. And that song, what a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. Do I enjoy a rapport with other servants of God? Jerry's often said that we are friends with those who are friends with Jesus. We are friends of those who are friends with Jesus. And then, am I plagued with constant fear? I was before I got saved. And uh, after I got saved, uh, there was a time in my life when I was for about a year uh, totally out of the will of God. Both times, when I was unsaved, and then as a Christian, when I was carnal and unclean in the sight of God, even though I was saved, I experienced this terrible fear. The, the fear of death, the fear of judgment, the fear of failure, and uh, the fear of just living my life for no purpose and accomplishing no goals. John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect fear, perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Doesn't mean that, that uh, if you say, I mean, if you ever doubt your salvation and fear that you've lost it, uh, that you're not saved in the first place, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that you have not been made perfect in love, or that is to say, you have not possessed 
that spiritual maturity that God desires for all believers to possess. Another question, am I able to overcome the world? John says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Uh, do I have the indwelling power within me? That's the Spirit of God, of course, to give up these habits. I never thought that I could overcome smoking. I've used this testimony before, and I threw away my cigarette, my last cigarette, 20 minutes before I entered the Moody Bible Institute. And I remember on the way uh, from the hotel where I stayed, my uncle was taking me uh, to Moody, and I threw a cigarette out the window, and I was just about ready to go home. I was so discouraged because I just knew I couldn't overcome this. But God told me, uh, you better give me a chance, and if you don't, I'll kill you. And so I decided I better let him take me to Moody. And uh, so I stopped at a drugstore and got some Sensen uh, uh, medicine there, uh, little uh, tablets uh, to take away the smell of, uh, of tobacco. And then I got some, chewed some Wrigley's gum to take away the smell of the Sensen. And I walked in there, uh, as they would say today, cold turkey. Uh, but from that point on, and that was in 19... Uh, 52, and let's see, that's 62, uh, 25 years ago, and, uh, well, I think I've got it whipped because I haven't touched it in those 25 years. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> I might say this, that, that uh, you know, uh, sci uh, scientists and psychologists tell us that there's two uh, key dreams that everybody has, one that you're properly, or you're improperly in clo uh, clothed in in uh, pulpit, or I'm sorry, that you're without clothes in public. Uh, and the second uh, thing, a great fear, is that you're falling, you dream you're falling from a high place. Well, I've had those two fears also, but one of the fears I had uh, right after I entered the ministry, a few years after I quit smoking, was that uh, I was smoking, I had returned to smoking, and the deacons had caught me, and I was smoking a cigarette, and, the, and a mean old deacon saw me. Well, that didn't happen, of course, but uh, do I have the power within to overcome the world? And that's a good sign, not only that I am saved, but that I am in right fellowship with God. The Bible says that Jesus said on one occasion, uh, In this world ye shall have tribulation. But he said, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And then... Uh, number uh, 10 here in this question, 10, uh, 12 questions, can I recognize false doctrine when it comes my way? John tells his beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby ye know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit, this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Even in John's time there was this spirit of the Antichrist. Now, what is the spirit of the Antichrist? It's basically a denial of the deity of Christ, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you can tell a cultist right away, You can, uh, they can talk about uh, perhaps uh, salvation, and they have a different uh, word in mind than what you would have. They can talk about resurrection. Uh, by that they mean newness of mind, and, and uh, you know, in the winter the birds fly south, and the, the spring they come back again, and the flowers begin to bloom, and and you have a resurrection uh, uh, from the dead, sterile winter uh, to the uh, thrilling, uh, uh, thrilling uh, uh, nature of spring. Well, you see, they use various words, and they might, uh, they might to, uh, they, uh, by listening to them, unless you listen to them very carefully, they can trick you. But if you want to know where a cult stands right away, say, tell me, who was Jesus Christ? And if he hesitates one minute, one second, doubtless he is of Antichrist. If, unless he says, well, Jesus Christ was the virgin-born Son of God. 
He was God of God, and he lived a perfect life. And then he died a vicarious death for all the world. The third day he rose again bodily from the dead. Forty days after that he ascended bodily from the Mount of Olives, and some day soon the Bible says that he's coming again to this earth first to receive his own at the rapture, and then later to defeat the devil at the battle of Armageddon, and then to set up his millennial 1,000-year reign of Christ. And I want to tell you, if a fellow can tell you that in one breath, or even in two or three different breaths, then he doubtless is of God, or at least he knows something about God. So uh, can I recognize false doctrine uh, when it comes my way? Anymore, I can uh, almost do that, and I know it's not because I'm that smart, but I can listen to a radio broadcast, and maybe the fellow is saying some pretty good things, but sometimes cults can say some pretty good things too, but I can almost get the feel uh, of the message and of the speaker whether this fellow is of God or whether he isn't. Uh, on one occasion, I remember hearing a marvelous sermon, one of the best I'd heard, uh, on Matthew chapter 13, the sower, the seed, and the soil. And I was driving my car, and I several times wanted to stop. I didn't do it. I today wish I had him, though, uh, because uh, he had so many wonderful thoughts. And, and I wanted to stop and get my pen, pencil and paper out, my notebook, and write down some of these statements that he was uh, just pouring uh, out of his mouth. Uh, but during all that time, I still felt a little uncomfortable listening to him. And later, I found that that uh, the man was uh, from the Mormon Church, and actually is a reorganized uh, church of um, the, Mor the Mormon Church, uh, Latter-day Saints there in Independence, Missouri. It was a break-off from the Salt Lake City group. But uh, it was a sort of my spirit uh, did not bear witness, or the Spirit of God did not bear witness with my spirit that this man that I was hearing was really of God. And uh, you don't have to listen to Garner Ted Armstrong very long to know the same thing. Now, he'll fool you for a while when he speaks about prophecy because he's good in that. A lot of the things he says is true, but, but it doesn't ring true as far as the person and work as Christ is concerned. So can I recognize false doctrines uh, when they come my way? Then am I straight on the deity of Christ? We've already touched on that. Whosoever, John said, shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Whosoever believeth, John continues, that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And every one that loveth him, that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, this has bothered some because of the statement, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, does this mean that everybody that gives mental assent to the deity of Christ, the historicity of Christ, is saved? And of course, the word believe there embraces both heart and mind. Remember when we studied the doctrine of heaven and hell, I made the statement, I asked a question, how, many, uh, how much distance do you think is involved, how many miles exist between heaven and hell? How many zillions of miles? Well, not a zillion miles at all. Actually, it's a very short distance, about 18 inches, because you can believe all this mentally, that Jesus died to save sinners, that there is a heaven, there is a hell, and eternity is forever, and yet die without doing anything about it and wake up in hell. But if you move all that uh, accumulated information about the Bible down from your brain about 18 inches to your heart and accept it, both heart and mind, uh, then... That's the difference between hell and heaven, some 18 inches. What we're saying here is that this believeth here, whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ, is born of God, uh, that uh, includes not only a head knowledge, uh, but a heart acceptance. And then finally, am I straight on the work of Christ? Am I straight on the deity? And now am I straight on the work of of Christ. Uh, what do I know about his uh, death on the cross, about his resurrection, about his ascension, and about his, uh, inner, about his second coming at the rapture and then uh, during the end of the tribulation? Well, let me hasten to say that uh, there are some Christians, many Christians, that know little about what Jesus is doing now. 
It doesn't mean they're not saved because they can explain, as hopefully you can now, the difference, for example, between the intercessory work of Christ and his work as an advocate. They are different. And uh, maybe they don't understand all the details of prophecy concerning his future work, the difference between the rapture and the second coming. But this simply means uh, that they are still immature as far as the Scripture is concerned and they need to read the Word of God. But what we're trying to say is that if uh, some of these questions you've had to answer in a negative way, it can mean one of two things. You're not saved, and probably that's not the answer, though. The second thing, then, that you need to get into the Word to pray to grow in grace by serving the Master. The source of our fellowship, the purpose of our fellowship, requirements of our fellowship, the test of our fellowship, and now the maintenance of our fellowship. A fellow by the name of Eric Hoffer, one of the leading philosophers of the world today, was asked some time ago on television, uh, what is the secret of Western civilization? How is it that uh, from the days uh, actually uh, really, for the past 2,000 years, uh, with minor exception, the great civilizations have been in the western part of the world and not the eastern part. And uh, he answered this way, because they have discovered the secret of maintenance. That is, not only of organizing a civilization, as the Orientals have been able to do, and the South Americans and the Chinese and the Asians, but in maintaining that organization and that civilization. I've known churches uh, that have started with a bang and have built and have grown phenomenally, and then they melt like snow in the bright sunset, sunrise. And you can go back to that church a few years later, and sometimes you won't even find it. It's disappeared. or. If it's still there, it's very weak and very ineffective because they know nothing about maintenance. Now, once we buy a new car, then we receive a maintenance manual. And what we're to do is read that so we might know how to maintain that beautiful car, uh, how much oil we should keep, and what kind of oil goes into the motor, and the amount of tire pressure and various other things that we need to know in order to keep that running at top efficiency. And when we get saved, God gives us a new nature, and that nature automatically enjoys the fellowship with God. But in order to maintain that fellowship, God has given us a maintenance manual, and that's a good name for the Bible because that's what the Bible is, God's maintenance manual given by the manufacturer. Uh, to the recipient, that he might know how to possess his vessel, as the Apostle Paul would say, a vessel unto honor. Now, uh, what assurances do we have that this sweet communion that we enjoy with Jesus when we get saved, today will be with us when we awaken tomorrow? And uh, this fellowship is kept by three things by the occupation of the Son, what the Son is now doing, by the habitation of the Spirit, where the Spirit is now living, and by the cooperation of the saint. The occupation of the Son, the habitation of the Spirit, and the cooperation of the saint, the saint of God. All right, now, let's look at these three. Through the occupation of the Son of God. Hey, whatever happened to Jesus? Is he still living? What's he doing? Where is he? Well, John answers these questions for us. He is with the Father, and he functions with the Father as our advocate and as our propitiation. Now, he's also called our intercessor, and John really doesn't uh, get into this, but he, he talks uh, somewhat, at least, about what Jesus is doing today. He is our advocate. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. But if a man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now the word advocate here uh, is a Greek word which literally means to call alongside of. It speaks almost of a defense attorney. And the New Schofield Bible 
defines this office of an advocate as follows. Advocacy is that work of Jesus Christ for sinning believers which he carries on with the Father whereby because of the eternal efficacy of Christ's sacrifice he restores them the fellowship. So this fellowship is maintained, if I desire to be maintained, number one, because of the occupation, the present work, the ministry, the job, the employment of the Lord Jesus Christ. He acts as my advocate and then as my propitiation. My advocate is what he does for me now. My propitiation is what he once did for me. In chapter 2, verse 2, John says, And he, speaking of Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of of the whole world. Now the root Greek word here, trans propitiation, is rendered mercy seat in Hebrews 9 verse 5, referring to that piece of furniture in the tabernacle. And uh, the mercy seat was of course a part of the sacred ark of the covenant which rested in the Holy of Holies. And upon this golden mercy seat, every day of atonement during Yom Kippur, that would be uh, tied in with our October and November. Um, there was blood sprinkled upon this mercy seat, the blood of an animal. In Leviticus 16, we read about that. And this meant that the righteous sentence of the law had been executed, uh, changing a judgment seat into a mercy seat. You see, above the, Chica uh, above the uh, Ark of the Covenant, which was like a cedar chest that opened up, and uh, the top of that uh, cedar chest was uh, a golden lid, and that lid was called the, the mercy seat. Now, uh, underneath that mercy seat was the broken law that man couldn't keep. And right above the Ark of the Covenant was God's Shekinah glory cloud, His holiness, His visible manifestation of His holiness. You see, the only thing that separated the wrath of God, the holiness of God, the demands of God from above that, that uh, mercy seat, uh, the only thing that separated that from the broken law was the blood of the Lamb. And that became known as uh, the propitiation, the satisfaction seat. And that uh, judgment seat now, of course, as I said, turned into a mercy seat. It signified the spreading of blood, sprinkling of blood, that man had thus been reconciled to God. And so the work of Christ thus served as a propitiation whereby God's righteousness was forever satisfied. So think of it this way. My propitiation is what he did to get me saved, and his work as an advocate is what he does to keep me saved. But how is this fellowship maintained? It's maintained by the present ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and his past ministry. And then, number two, through the habitation of of the Spirit of God, the occupation of the Son of God, the habitation, that means the dwelling place, of the Spirit of God. Where does the Holy Spirit live? John is very clear on this, as the Apostle Paul had been clear on a number of passages. John 2, 20, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you. Now, that's the definition here uh, of probably the Christian life, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Christ lives in the believer along with the Holy Spirit. And in John 14, it seemingly suggests that the Father, Jesus said, if a man loves me uh, and my Father, we will come and dwell with him. But the habitation of the Spirit is in our hearts. One of the most impossible questions we ever have to answer around here is the question that sometimes tourists might ask if they um, may recognize one of us from television downtown. And they say, oh, could you tell me, I recognize you, seen your picture on TV, could you tell me, I want to visit the Thomas Road Baptist Church. Where is the Thomas Road Baptist Church? Uh, well, the FBI would have a tough time telling you where the Thomas Road Baptist Church because I'd have to point in 15,000 different directions. That's the number of members we have now. Now, the building, Thomas Road Baptist Church, is 701 Thomas Road, and that's pretty easy. 
to tell. But the church uh, is, consists of believers. And Paul says, What know ye not your bodies is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit now lives in us. And what does it do? Well, it says that uh, it assures us of the knowledge we need to live the Christian life. Ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, this doesn't uh, say uh, that uh, a student doesn't need a teacher, because he does. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that God gave some to be pastors and teachers and some to be teachers. Uh, what this does say is that we need no one teach us concerning the uh, ministry of an Antichrist. And that's what the whole context is about. If someone comes along and denies the deity of Christ, uh, the Spirit of God will bear witness with his spirit, hey, this fellow is of the devil. And you can't go along with the Jehovah Witnesses because they deny the deity of Christ. You can't go along with the Mormons because they deny the deity of Christ. You can't go along with the Seventh-day Adventists because they deny, not the deity, but deny other doctrines in the Bible. Uh, they deny the grace of God, putting us back under the law. You can't go along with Garner Ted Armstrong because that group denies the deity of Christ. And no man needs any earthly teacher, no child of God, if he's reading the Word of God, for uh, a teacher to tell him that movement is not of God. It didn't take our kids here at Thomas Road very long to find out about the errors of the Sung Moon movement. And this was before there was any articles. Uh, in fact, uh, some of them found out uh, even before I did uh, because uh, these little gals, when I would uh, make my way to the Washington airport uh, from Lynchburg here, and these pretty little gals would stop me and pin a flower on me. And uh, my wife said I would uh, uh, probably have given them money anyway because I, I guess I'm a sucker for uh, somebody like that. Uh, I'll, well, give them a dollar. Maybe they'll use it for a good cause. Well, uh, you see, some of our students, so they begin to wonder about that, and this was three or four years ago, and of course then I, when I questioned their doctrine, why uh, examined their doctrine, immediately I didn't do that either, but uh, no student, uh, my son, who was uh, at that time 12 years old, he knew something uh, was not as it should be uh, when uh, he began to hear about Sung Moon, this Korean savior. All right, now the third way that God has given us to assure us whereby we might maintain this fellowship, we have the occupation of the Son, what the Son is now doing, the habitation of the Spirit, the Spirit of God working in our hearts, giving us this anointing and this, and this assurance that we need, and then the cooperation of the saint of God. By the way, there's a mistake here. Um, right above... Uh, Point number C, you have uh, C, 1 Thessalonians 17, verse 11. Well, obviously, 1 Thessalonians doesn't have 17 chapters. I meant C, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, about the church in Thessalonica. That's what I meant. And then the third thing here, as we said, is the cooperation of the saint of God. How is the believer expected to help maintain his fellowship with heaven? Number one, he's to recognize his sins. If we say we have no sin, the Bible says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then he needs to confess those sins, to recognize and confess. And by following both these little scriptural rules, we are guaranteed that this beautiful fellowship that we once had when we accepted Christ will continue. God warned the church at Ephesus to return to him because he said, you have left your first love. Thank God he did not say they had lost it, but he did say they had left it. We have a few minutes, but I'm going to close at this time, and then we'll take the final lecture on 1 John, 
on the next tape and that'll be lecture number three and then I'll take uh, the remaining lecture of the four series and we'll go through second and third John.